The reason free enterprise came about was because I, this is, here's a great, this is a great Hollywood story. I mean, I don't know if it's great, but I'll tell you it, 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 from a professional standpoint. So I worked out of a post-production facility in LA called Midtown Edit. It was across from the Beverly Center, a big mall. I've been working out of there for a long time. And this is about, I want to say this is 1996 and 1996, 97. And um, I did a lot of freelance work. I cut trailers. I cut music videos. And I've been regularly working on a show called Jody Horowitz Presents. That was on Showtime. And she was like, she would do news magazine shows. It was, it was interesting. She'd go to like UFO conventions. And if they had a UFO movie on Showtime, they would show her a 15-minute news segment that I, I would cut. She won a she won a like an Emmy award or something. So um I was working on that and on my answering machine message, as I say on my own YouTube show, even today, I would always end, I would say, oh, thank you for calling my uh, Robert Meyer Burnett, uh, leave a message, and as always, have a better day. And so this guy calls and he goes, What does it mean to have a better day? I don't know, I don't know what it means. I need an editor. I want you to explain to me what have a better day means. So here's my number. Call me. So I call him up and he says, <laughs> well, you know, I was, I was calling up a bunch of editors and I wasn't leaving messages, but they told me you were good. And, and uh, I, I left that message and I wanted to know what have a better day means. So I talked to this guy, he goes, I want to hire you to edit a trailer for our Quentin Tarantino esque crime thriller movie. Uh, cool. And the movie was called The Asphalt Quartet. And it was directed by a guy named Peter Rossi, who had co-written the script. And I I I I was given, I was sent to their edit bay. Normally, when you cut a trailer, you get like the finished film and whatever. But I was given because the movie wasn't quite done. So I had to, I was given the the I had access to everything. The entire film was online. I'm looking at it. And it was terrible. It was really, really, really bad. And not only that, it was horribly edited. And so I cut a trailer. And uh, like a week later, the, the producer of the movie comes in and he he looks at the trailer. He's like, I love your trailer. This is great. And I'm like, oh, God, I'm glad you like it. He goes, well, what do you think of the movie? And I've, I, I don't uh, pull punches. I said, this movie's terrible. It's really, really bad. And I said, not only is it really bad, but it was really badly edited because there's a lot of footage in here that was never used. And I was kind of shocked, to be honest. And this guy looks at me, and I didn't really know he was a, a, a Jewish gangster from New Jersey who was putting money into movies. I didn't know that. So here I'm telling this guy the truth about his film. And he looks at me and goes, I'll tell you what. I'll give you two weeks. I'll pay you 2,500 bucks a week. And back in 1995, for me, I'm like, holy shit. I'm working on these low budget indie movies. For me at that time, 2,500 bucks a week was a lot of money. And I'm like, okay. Uh, he goes, you can, you, you I want, you're going to re edit this movie. I don't care what you do to it. You do whatever you want. And so basically, I moved into the edit bay. And any moment of sleep that I needed, I would take cat naps. I'd like sleep on the couch. I wake up, I'd edit, 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 and go to sleep. I never. I went home every third day just because I couldn't stand smelling myself, and I'd take a shower and change my clothes. And I would just I would cut, 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 cut. And I'm like, Brrr. and I finished this movie, and it went from being god awful to once again being mediocre. But I was damn proud of that mediocrity. And they came in, you know, after I aired out the place, you know, used air freshener and make sure it didn't stink. But they watched the film and and the producer, he looked at it and he goes, this is this is amazing. How did you do this? And I said, well, it was there. The movie was already there. It was what you shot. I just tried to make it better. And he loved it. He said, I'm going with your cut. I'm like, great. He goes, what do you want to do next? And I said, well, I've been noodling with this idea. I want to make a a Jew. I want to make the Jewish Exorcist, and he was a Jew, he was he was Jewish, and he laughed. He, he started doing Mel Mel Brooks impression. Ah, what the? 
uh, the, the exorcism, it costs too much money. You're not going to like all that. And I'm like, no, no, no. I, I want to make the Jewish exorcist the same way that vampirism is informed by Catholicism. I want to make a horror film based on Yiddish mythology, like Osmodius and Lilith and the Yeni Velt and Mirror Realm and the Lamed Vav, the Righteous Man and all this. And he looked at me like I was crazy. I go, no, 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 that's what I want to do. And he goes, I'll, I'll, fine, I'll pay you to write that script. Let's go make that movie. And I'm like, can I direct that movie? He's like, you're going to direct that movie. I'm like, okay. So is anyone even there still? I don't even know. Yeah, we're just listening to it. Oh, oh, yeah, we're yeah. I was like, I know what's saying. I was really into the story. (laughs) I was really into it. So okay, so so I call up my friend Mark Altman, and Mark Altman was publishing Sci Fi Universe magazine, and Mark Altman was a guy who I admired because he wrote these hundred page articles about uh, uh, Star Trek: The Next Generation for Cinefantastic, and I called him up, and he had made me critic at large at Sci Fi Universe that was being published by Larry Flint in an office in Larry Flint's building. I call him up. I go, bruh, I have an opportunity. They're going to pay us to write a script. And I pitched him the idea. And Mark can write things really fast. And I would slave over every line. And I said, you want to help me out? And he's like, yeah. And then it turns out that Larry Flint sold sci-fi because he would sell any non-pornographic magazine to anyone at any time so he sold sci-fi universe magazine our the magazine that i met half my friends i know writing for to the sci-fi channel because it was their it was our they, they our magazine was a rival magazine and sci-fi universe was our our tagline was the magazine for sci-fi fans with a life it was a great time and i met so many great people so much fun to write for so they sold the magazine out from under mark so mark comes over and we write together we we write day of atonement i even had a poster made day of atonement it's too late to be forgiven because the whole thing about day of atonement is it's a jew you have to go before god and you have he doesn't you you're not you're never absolved of your sins but you have to explain what they are and admit what you've done so that the the whole script was and by the way it was like 250 pages and it was just awful it was a terrible script. And we knew it was a terrible script. We had to turn it in like the next day. And at this point, I was now working on the Star Trek experience, the $80 million Star Trek experience in Vegas. And I was tasked to cut all of the videos that would play through the pre-ride thing and also in Quark's bar. And, and then when you first walked in, it was the greatest gig ever. Paid me money to watch Star Trek and cut stuff. So anyway, so I was working on that. And and Mark calls me up and he says, we can't turn this script in. We can't turn David Toman in. And I'm like, okay. And then he reads me a scene of my own youth that I told him about where I got beat up because I wore a Star Trek uniform to seventh grade when Star Trek The Motion Picture opened. And Mike Elfendahl took me into the girls' bathroom and beat me up. So Mark had rewritten this scene. And in the scene, it was outside. I get beaten up. And when I'm passed out, I have a vision of William Shatner. William Shatner comes to me and gives me some advice. And I'm like, bruh. I didn't say bruh because no one said bruh then. I was like, dude, that shit's awesome. I didn't say dope, which I always say now. But And I read this. I'm like, this is hilarious. And what? And he's like, what if we wrote a movie about like ourselves? And it was about our lives in, in LA. And what if William Shatner was our spirit animal our guru and mark said like woody allen's movie played again sam and i'm like that's awesome i'm like what if we could actually get william shatner to be in this movie and mark's like well that would be the plan so mark again writes like a 250 page draft and he gives it to me and i read it and i rewrite the whole thing i start from page one i rewrite the whole script with my own input then i give it back to mark and Mark rewrites the script and, and and we're honing it down. We're making it smaller. And then we finally got into a room together where Mark and I are literally taking turns on the typewriter. We're acting out scenes. We're doing dialogue and all this. And we write the script. And the script was called Trekkers because a Trekkies was derogatory. And, and we, we finally... We told them that we had to, we're not going to turn in Day of Atonement. And then as a Hail Mary pass, we turned in what was at the time called Trekkers, 
where William Shatner was this, these two characters, and we just took our own lives in L.A. We were inspired by chasing Amy and Swingers. We figured Swingers was our touchstone because I knew all those guys. I knew Favreau. You know, I knew because they were all friends of Peter Billingsley. And so I was I was hanging out with these guys. They'd come to my parties and we'd go out with them. And so when Swingers came out, I knew them when they were making Swingers. I'm like, oh, my God, we'll do this, but we'll do it with geeks instead. So, um, so Mark and I wrote the script. They fucking loved it. They loved the script. And and our producer, Mort Salkheim, was like, I'm going to put up the money for this movie. And then one thing came to another and then we started for six months we started having meetings with financiers because more talk like the guy who produced asphalt quartet couldn't finance it and then we found an angel investor who crazily enough the first day i met him he basically wrote a check for 150 grand at the plaza in new york after afternoon tea he goes get started set up a bank account go make the movie i'll send you the million bucks at the end of the week and we're like what <laughs> and 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 that's exactly what happened and we started making the film and we started casting who we couldn't get was William Shatter. Right. I was going to say, my next question is then how yeah. did you get the show? So William Shatter, you know, we, we went to anybody and anyone, anybody and everybody who knew anything about William Shatter. We're like, can you please try and get this to him? Right before Christmas of 1997, William Shatter called me on the phone. And he basically said, I love your script, Trekkers. It's really funny. And uh, the problem I have with it is I'm this imaginary character. I'm an, an imaginary friend. I'm essentially God who shows up. And he said, I can't. This is embarrassing to me. You've written me as this guru who knows. He, and he actually said this on the phone. He goes, I'm a fucked up guy. I, I've got problems. And I, I'm like, we're like, and Mark and I are now on the phone together. Uh, and we're like, what problems do you have? And he's like, well, women. He's like, I've got daughters, man. I got ex-wives. I mean, I got women coming out my ears. I got problems. I got all kinds of things. He's like, you know, you, you've written me as this character. I mean, the 70s were terrible for me. And, and everyone thinks, oh, I'm Captain Kirk. But like, I mean, rescue 911. And he just was opening up. And he's like, I can't be in your movie because I would find it embarrassing. And we're like, we've lost him. And the movie's already financed. And if we don't have William Shatner, we actually had, believe it or not, we had a, a different draft of the film called Solar Quest, where we were going to Galaxy Quest it up. This is pre-Galaxy Quest, where we were going to make Solar Quest and have like Malcolm McDowell play a Shatner-esque character and make it fictional. And so we're trying to keep him on the phone. And we're like, Bill, he asked us to call him Bill. Well, is there any way you would reconsider the script? And he said, well, if you were to like rewrite the character of Bill and make him a fucked up guy, maybe, I mean, I'll read your rewrite. I'm not saying I'm going to do the movie. He brought up Kim Basinger and Boxing Helena, which is a whole Hollywood story. Look at look that up on Wikipedia. But um, uh, he said, I'm not going to be Kim Basinger and Boxing Helena, so I'm not going to say anything, but I'll read your rewrite. So we we spent the Christmas season. We were supposed to, by the way, start shooting this movie in the end of January of 1998. And we just figured we'd get Shatner. So it's Christmas of 97, and, and Mark is furiously rewriting the script. Then I'm rewriting the script. We're trying to make it better. And we sent it to Shatner and we knew when we sent him the script, he, he is a man of, of commerce. It's like, we had to give him money. We had to make an offer and we're like, here's, here's the offer we're making you bill. Here's the script. And by the way, we knew he would go up to a certain level. So we offered him less than that level. We send the script. We send him the offer at noon and he said, I'll call you back at one. So all of us, like everybody involved in the production is standing around his phone. Shatner calls back and he says, this is a very generous offer here. He goes, this is a very generous offer. And out of his mouth, he said, I want this, which is what we knew he would go to. He just told us that. And we're like, done. And he's like, great. Send me a check. No agents, no contracts. I mean, those, those came later. Nothing. 
We're like, done. So that's awesome. how we got William Shatner to make Free Enterprise. <laughs> so then the movie comes <laughs> out and all that stuff. Um, and how did then did you get to this specific DVD version of it from Anchor Bay, which is a loaded disc? But I would expect nothing less. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, you, uh, so what was interesting about yeah. that was it came out originally from Pioneer, and I was never happy with the the version that we. You know what? When we made Free Enterprise, Wasn't that basically like uh, the same as the Laserdisc rip or something shit like yeah, that. The, no, yeah. the laser the Laserdisc version, the first Pioneer DVD version, are the same. Now, here's the thing. Because I was working with Mark, I really felt that Free Enterprise was a collective effort. And I was, it's the only movie I've directed, but I was not comfortable exerting the creative control I could have probably exerted because it was a collective effort. And the first version of Free Enterprise, there were scenes missing that I didn't think should have been missing. And I, you know, the movie was never, and I was learning. It was weird. Mark and I are precious about it. So I was given an opportunity. Mark had sold the film after Pioneer didn't own it anymore. They sold the film to, or they made a deal to release it with Anchor Bay, which was really exciting. And Anchor Bay pulled out all the stops. They gave me money to do a new version of the movie. They paid for a new transfer. And so I got to add scenes, but what I didn't do, which is what I should have done, was like free enterprise, every single edit in the movie could stand to be shortened by five frames, 10 frames, just because I've learned so much more about editing. So the version that we put out in two, it actually came out in 2006, was my preferred version of the movie with, with extra scenes, but I didn't edit the film down. Now, you would never know the people that love free enterprise would never know my, 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 I, I have a version of, I, I have re-edited that version, the anchor Bay version of free enterprise as what I would like to do in 4k. And it's about five minutes shorter. The scenes are the same. Now it's five minutes shorter, but I would like to add, there are two scenes that I wasn't able to add to that anchor uh, Bay version that I think would make the movie better. One is another scene with Claire, Rob's girlfriend, because I couldn't find the tapes that we were missing a tape that had the negative on them. So I didn't have time, but I'd love to go back in and do that. So to do, I'd love to do a definitive version of free enterprise. And again, I would have to make it a period piece because it's set in 1999 and I need to do the movie actually takes place. It opens on, on, in my mind, September 13th, 1999, which is the day the moon is blown out of Earth's orbit in space, 1999. So there you go. <laughs> so that's, uh, there you go. There's the story of free enterprise. Nice. So 